So, today we do the second part of the lecture on the castle of Cagliostro. Why did Count Cagliostro want the marriage and the ring? Rumored director's cut. Why didn't Lupin take Clarice with him? And what's behind the immortal Your Heart line? I'll be talking about these four topics. Okay, so I'll just cut to the chase. Hope that's okay. So, what captures me the most about this, the castle of Cagliostro, is one question. Why Count Cagliostro wanted the marriage and the ring? I mean, like I told you in the previous lecture, the motive behind the actions of Lupin in the castle of Cagliostro is not quite clear. Uncover the mystery of gothic bills? I don't think so. Saving Clarice? Then why did he show his interest in the original bills in the last scene? Clarice's behavior also seems a little unreasonable. If she just didn't want to marry a guy she doesn't like, she could have just walked out from her convent with an undoubtedly lower security level. She didn't have to wait for the Count to take her to his castle only to steal the car and flee. If she wanted to make Cagliostro, the country, a better place, she could have just married the Count and waited for her time to come. Maybe not while the Count is alive, but maybe in their children's time. The Count will die before her for sure. When that time comes, maybe she can start a coup to make a fresh start for the country. So, actually, Lupin, the protagonist, as well as Clarice, their behaviors kind of lack reasonable context. In this film, the Count Cagliostro is the only one with a clear and explicit goal. We can actually see where Count Cagliostro is going. For example, in a relatively well-known scene, in the A part, after Lupin sneaks in, oh sorry, in the B part, in a scene after he sneaks into the castle, the Count holds Clarice's face in his hand. The Count grabbing Clarice who tried to escape and failed says, my hands are stained in blood, in response to her condemning him as a murderer. Murderer, you're not human, she says, and the Count harshly responds saying, yes, my hands are stained in blood. My family is the shadow of yours. With conspiracy and murder, we have sustained generations of archdukes. Don't pretend you don't know. And then he shows a gentle side saying, Clarice, for 400 long years, the light and shadow have been apart, but now our two families unite in maybe a rather indecent tone. Then, Count Cagliostro pressures her again, saying something like, Our two rings together, they will restore our ancestors' hidden treasure. This is where we clearly see what the Count is up to. Those lines reveal his obvious goals, unification of the Cagliostro families that have been separated in two, and finding the family treasure. But we kind of feel that there is something more. Lupin sees what it is and points it out to him. When Lupin makes his first intrusion, no, I mean, when he was attacked by a group of hitmen by the name of Shadow with fingers like claws, Lupin leaves a message card on the back of Judo, who is later revealed to be one of them. When ordered by the Count, Judo nervously reads the death threat saying, To the Count of Lust and Greed, I will have your bride. Hearing this, the Count simply sneers like he just doesn't care. What did he mean by lust and greed? Lust is obviously a sexual desire. And this greed means appetite for power. So lust and greed, it means you want the girl and you want the power. The death threat points out the Count's hidden desire, the affection, emotion, and feelings toward Clarice. But the Count didn't care. This is because, at this point, Clarice is not the subject of his affection. This is why he locked her in a convent until their marriage. If he loves her, there is no way he will keep her there until the ceremony. It would be so easy for him to keep her around him. It should not be hard for him, a man of such talent, to say anything that would make a 10-year-old girl obey him. He can just so easily keep a good relationship with her for about 5 years, or maybe 10. Instead, he put her into the convent and didn't show a sign of interest. This is because he actually did not care about her and had no interest in her. Still, despite such a fact we know, 
Lupin makes a questionable remark in a scene rather close to the ending where he attempts to rescue Clarice. Lupin, disguised as an archbishop, sneaks into the wedding ceremony and makes a surprise move to steal the bride and the ring at the same time. Then after a big happy grin in response to Clarice hugging him saying, Mr. Lupin, he says, calm down you cradle robber, don't blow up, after unveiling the fireworks beneath his robe. Then the story comes to the climax scene. His words, calm down you cradle robber, it's another attempt to make fun of the feelings of Count Cagliostro toward Clarice. However, this is actually not quite obvious as well. So I guess we can see that Count Cagliostro, the only one with a clear agenda in the film, wants the three things I will mention. Yes, the goals that are the obvious ones. We will look into his ulterior motives behind the obvious ones. The first one, unification of the Cagliostro families. Yes, the vengeance of the Count family who had to take the dirty work. The second one, hidden treasure. Actually, the Count has no idea what the hidden treasure is, but he believes it has to be huge. And the final one, love for Clarice. This is what he has at a subconscious level, so he gets pissed when it's pointed out. That's what many fans believe. Let's go into detail about these one by one. First of all, unification of the Cagliostro families. The vengeance from the Count forced to work under the Archdukes. Actually, this kind of plot is not unique to Cagliostro, and Miyazaki used this a lot in his works. For example, in Future Boy Conan, Lepka, the primary antagonist, wants to use solar power to rule over the world. And that's why he has to capture Lana, the granddaughter of Dr. Lau, quite a similar plot. In Raputa, Castle in the Sky, Muska wants to rule the world with the power of Raputa, but he was from a relatively minor branch of Laputa, so he wanted Shita from the head family of Raputa. Now the resemblance is uncanny. In this context, the Count seems like another typical bad guy in Miyazaki films. However, Lepka wanted Lana to obtain the secret of solar power. Shita, she had her volusite crystal she inherited. But why Clarice? The ring is all she can offer, making the reason to chase her vaguer than the other two. Besides, why does the Count want to unite the family in the first place? With their gothic bills, the Cagliostro family already ruled the underground society. What more did he want? Why did he have to unite the Count and the Archduke, the Shadow and the Light? The film does not quite give us the answer. In fact, I think the answer is hidden in the amazing map with default settings I showed you in the previous lecture. So this is the default setting map. Uh, uh, excuse me. You see this? It's written Upper Cagliostro and Lower Cagliostro in tiny letters. So the Cagliostro was divided into upper and lower classes and not into archdukes and counts. You see this in Raputa too. Of the people in the flowing city, people ranked as priests were waiting for their gods to return. On the other hand, the lower class people wanted to rule the earth using the power of Raputa. Miyazaki is interested in this theme. The difference between social classes with the upper and lower classes having different objectives. There was the line characterizing the Count, with conspiracy and murder we have sustained generations of archdukes. This clearly states that the family of Count Cagliostro was not originally in charge of making counterfeit bills. So the Count's family, the lower Cagliostro, was not very much involved in the counterfeiting and was actually in charge of conspiracy and murder. And I anticipate that the upper Cagliostro, the Archdukes, were in charge of counterfeiting. To explain this, I'll give you a description of the currency back in the days. So... This image sequence starts when Lupin and Zenigata finally escape from the dungeon and find the printers. 
Lupin explains after telling Zenigata, who wants answers, that they're in a production site for the counterfeit bills. The story goes like this. They've lurked in the shadows of Europe ever since the Middle Ages. They ruined the Bourbon kings and funded Napoleon. They even brought about the Great Crash of 1927. A black hole on the dark side of history. Many have tried to find its source and no one has ever come back. Lupin says it with his dramatic tone. So you see from this description, the Cagliostro were actually printing the bills for only 100 years. Bills, the paper money, started to be used in the 19th century in Europe. There is a British gold coin known as the Sovereign. As you know, the pirates like those in the Pirates of the Caribbean, they all have gold coins. Generally, those are either Spanish gold coins or the British sovereign. The sovereign was issued in England in the 19th century. Since large amounts of gold coins are too heavy to carry around, banknotes were issued by banks, who guaranteed that the notes could be converted back to the corresponding amount. This is known as convertible banknotes. The convertible banknote, the banknotes issued in England England in the 19th century is the original of the bills we use today, such as 1,000, 5,000, and 10,000 yen bills. That's why this image shows the early Cagliostro actually making counterfeit coins. Next image. This shows the medieval period, I mean, the French Revolution. This is a caricature of the age drawn by Miyazaki. You see Napoleon with the globe. The globe with the fuse. This indicates that Napoleon was trying to conquer the world. But there was a time limit. You see the fuse is lit. He has to hurry. So Napoleon was trying his best to conquer the world. He cannot waste his time. Why? Because this sack of money he carries, it has a hole, meaning that he is almost broke. With this single caricature depicting that time, Miyazaki indicates that Napoleon was facing a major financial crisis and that the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro, ruled by the Cagliostro family, was backing him up. About ruining the Bourbon kings, there was an incident known as the Affair of the Diamond Necklace. Actually, in this affair, Marie Antoinette herself did not purchase the necklace. Her friend, her best friend, some madam, purchased or attempted to purchase this absurdly expensive necklace, a diamond necklace that would have cost about 400 billion yen in 2018. Marie Antoinette was set up as a guarantor for the deal, the position she denied when she found out. Anyway, this led to a huge scandal in France, with people making up rumors about a lesbian relationship between the queen and madam. It was taken to court, but the absolute bad guys who actually tried to frame Marie walked out free of charge, directing the wrath of Parisians towards the queen. This is known to be one of the factors that triggered the French Revolution. In this affair, there was an occultist named Cagliostro who actually tried to sell the way overpriced jewelry to Marie. So the name Cagliostro actually appears in history. The Cagliostro was actually not a count, but he called himself one. He was an alchemist and a member of the Freemasons. There are historical facts about him, and the guy was not actually a count. There was a man who did research to find out that Cagliostro was just a countryman from Sicily, Italy. That man was a great German writer, politician, and thinker at that time. His name was Goethe. Goethe got angry about Cagliostro and decided to reveal who that guy actually was. So he took a personal trip to Italy and published a book about it titled Italian Journey, where he claims that he has finally found out the truth about Cagliostro. So you see how he the scandal caused by Cagliostro was. As mentioned above, he was an alchemist and a member of the Freemasons. So Miyazaki used the name the Count Cagliostro in this movie. Let's keep in mind that he was an alchemist. This previous image, this depicts Germany's 30 years war. You see the war going on in the background. This German 30 years war is known as the last and the largest religious war that broke out between the Protestants and the Catholics in the 17th century. 
With that in the background, some bankers or lenders are assessing money. Any kind of money and coin, including the British sovereign back in this time, did not indicate any numerical value such as a dollar or a pound. They had to weigh the coins one by one and measure the specific weight to determine the content of gold, which defines the value of the coin. So engraving values on the coins was nothing more than formality, and here you see the transaction of that. That's what that money was in this age. And then this image transitions to... Here we go. This image. German soldiers are finding a huge amount of German mark bills, which should be fake, in a carriage of a crashed Royal Air Force, I mean aircraft. This insinuates that Cagliostro may have also helped the Alliance win World War II. This depicts that their counterfeit business became major enough to even team up with the British government. Okay, let's return to the castle of Cagliostro. These details clearly tell us that the Cagliostro family introduced printing to their counterfeiting only after the beginning of the 20th century. This means that logically, they had to have spent most of their time, that is from the 16th to the 19th century, making counterfeit coins. If not, it does not make sense. There was a printing room in the castle. The printing room was made in the same building where all the conspiracies and killings took place as the specialized business of the Lower Cagliostro. This can only mean that the printing started in the castle of the Count Cagliostro. Where were the counterfeit coins made? You cannot get an answer from the movie, but I imagine that it should have been in the jurisdiction of the Upper Cagliostro, the Archdukes. It's more like my imagination, but it's the only logical explanation. The Cagliostro back in the days, the Upper Cagliostro and the Lower Cagliostro, were in charge of different agendas. The Upper Cagliostro was in charge of making counterfeit coins and politics, which means making marital relations with other countries in Europe through marriage. Meanwhile, the lower Cagliostro, the count, was in charge of conspiracy and murder. These are the basic statuses of the upper Cagliostro and the lower Cagliostro. The actual Cagliostro in history was an alchemist, an occultist trying to make gold from less valuable metals such as copper and lead. I think Miyazaki translated this image into a group of people manipulating the value of the coins they issued, and used the name Cagliostro and counterfeiting as their background. If they were counterfeiting bills from the start, the story of the history of the Cagliostro family could have just started from the 19th century. The year 1517 was designated, clearly indicating that they were in the coin counterfeiting business. However, the coins, the business of the upper Cagliostro, became worthless. That's why the lower Cagliostro also became in charge of the counterfeiting, ruining the power balance between the families. The power balance was maintained with the upper Cagliostro making counterfeits and doing politics, and the lower Cagliostro doing conspiracy and murder. This is what can be seen as a symbolic relationship between a pop star and the manager, which came to an end when the counterfeiting by the upper Cagliostro became obsolete. So the lower Cagliostro took over the counterfeiting and the power balance was ruined. The Count family making counterfeit bills, because the Archdukes no longer could, would think why they have to be the lower one. Why do we have to be under the Archdukes? Such doubts and the anger of the Count Cagliostro are only natural. That's why the Count Cagliostro planned the assassination of the worthless upper family. The killing succeeded and he embarked on modernizing the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro. Supposedly, this should be the truth behind the killing of the Archdukes. It was a modernization movement. Why did the counterfeit coins made by the Archdukes become worthless? That is because, as mentioned above, the sovereign was issued in the 19th century, but soon it became substantially pointless carrying around a load of coins and making payments. Furthermore, the international economy became unsustainable due to the system where only the countries with gold could issue their currencies. So the world had to transition from the convertible note that could be freely exchanged for gold or silver 
to an inconvertible note which cannot be exchanged for that. That's why the counterfeit coins produced by the Archduke simply became obsolete. This should be the reason behind the Count family killing, wiping out the Archdukes. This raises a question. If he wiped them out, why couldn't he just leave it that way? The Count got rid of the Archdukes. Why do they have to reunite? Let's go back to the list. Okay. The Cagliostro families had to unite. It had to happen because of the hidden treasure. A huge treasure kept secret even to the Count himself. So the catch is, if you want the treasure, you have to reunite. We saw the movie, so we saw the treasure, but Count Cagliostro didn't know what it was until the end. In the movie, it was revealed to be a Roman ruin in the end. The ruin is shown in this landscape image. This image. Many people saw this a number of times on TV. The view slides in this direction to show it entirely. The Roman ruin emerging from the lake in front of the former resident of the Archdukes. You see this? You'll finally know what this is when I tell you today. There is a distinct feature. This is not just a typical Roman ruin. What it is, that, like the top of all these pillars, the visible parts above the waterline, these parts are colored in gold. It's because they are gold. This is some sort of El Dorado. This is the big secret. Lupin didn't notice this, so he said, when the Romans were driven out, they flooded it with water, and your ancestors secretly took it over. He said the Romans driven out flooded it. He continues, your ancestors secretly took it over. It's the treasure for the world, too big to go into my pocket. We simply believe in that. But what is drawn is clearly different from the actual Roman ruins found in the world so far. So... The secret which has led to the discovery of this Roman ruin is the rings. This is the one Clarice wore. Let's see this part in an enlarged view. So you see there is something written on it. Lupin recognized it as Gothic characters and he reads it. Revival will come when light doth again with shadow unite 1517. The year is clearly specified. What happened in 1517? According to Lupin, when the Romans were driven out, they flooded it, and Clarice's ancestors secretly took it over. This doesn't seem right. 1517 was the time of Renaissance, maybe at the peak of the Renaissance movement. So according to history, it was the time when people re-evaluated and went crazy about the Greek and Roman culture. This means that they had no reason to hide it. If it was 150 years earlier, maybe it had to be hidden from the attack of the savages. Also, if it was 50 years later, it had to be hidden because some king of Spain, I think it was Charles V, this guy started another religious war, destroying Roman ruins like crazy. It's called Sack of Rome, the savages. So, if it was... 50 years later, the flooding might have made sense to hide it from the destroyers trying to destroy all the Roman ruins on the planet. This year, 1517, designated by Miyazaki, it was the time of the Renaissance when a Roman ruin could just stand there and people liked it. People would go, ah, the Renaissance. Let's go back to the image. These parts above the water level, they're all gold. The roof, the pillars, they're all golden. It's because they coated marble with gold. We know this because we have seen this in Japuta, the castle in the sky. Do you remember the scene where the soldiers charged into Laputa and started ripping things off the walls and pillars? They were ripping off the gold. 
Gold parts in the ancient temple building? They are not painted. They are actually coated with gold foils. That's why in Raputa, the soldiers were ripping off the gold. The marble was not printed in gold, it was coated with real gold. Pure gold. This Roman ruin is depicted in the same way. These are actually covered in gold. I suppose that the upper Cagliostro family used the gold from this golden city to make their counterfeit coins. This was the secret behind the prosperity of the upper Cagliostro. However, I think around 1517, they used up all the gold, only leaving some thin gold foil in these upper portions. You see, a place in this Roman ruin where Cagliostro, I mean Lupin and Clarice, took a walk holding hands. It has a rather marble-like color. Only the upper part from the bird's eye view you first see is gold. And where they take a walk, it's plain marble, like you can see in the white background. This means that the gold has been ripped off. So what happened is that around 1517, they used up the heritage of the golden city almost completely. Leaving gold only on a few difficult to reach locations like on the roofs and on the pillars. Then the ancestors decided to submerge the ruin and hide it. Why? Because they wanted to hide the fact that they were out of the gold they used to issue their coins. I think they disclosed this golden city to a limited list of people like kings and the Pope to make rumors and bluff people into believing that Cagliostro has a divine financial power to issue an unlimited amount of coins and alchemistic power to make an unlimited amount of gold. Backed by this reputation, they started counterfeiting. Up until 1517, the Cagliostro actually had gold, so they issued gold coins. When they ran out of gold, they started making fake coins. This is the reason why the Cagliostro family split in two, and it is the secret of this year. This is the biggest secret they had to hide because they wanted to cover up the fact that they were already out of gold. I summarize this for the sake of easier understanding. Here, the history of Cagliostro. <laughs> The history from the Ota King perspective. From the Middle Ages to around 1516, they prospered thanks to the gold from the Roman ruin. But then they ran out of gold so they flooded the ruin to protect their reputation. Then until around the 19th century, they issued fake coins claiming they were made using alchemy. And from the 19th century to around 1970, they shifted their business from fake coins to counterfeit bills. This shift ruined the power balance resulting in the art Duke family being assassinated and their residence burned down. In 1979, no, 78, the Lupin incident occurred. This incident, I mean a major affair that could even lead to a political crisis, so the Lupin incident resulted in the revival of the Archduke Cagliostro. The revival of the Archduke Cagliostro completed by Clarice de Cagliostro taking the throne. So this was a uh, chronological history of events only within the Cagliostro family. So, returning to the first question, why did the Count want to unify the Cagliostro families? We'll go into this little further in detail later. The Count actually did not know what the hidden treasure was. It was hidden in the past to hide the fact that there is no more gold. And the great sarcastic twist in this film is that the Roman ruin came to light after 400 years only to be reassessed as the treasure of the world. And in summary, the Count destroyed the Archduke family that was already useless. Unfortunately, even though they are making a fortune out of the counterfeit bills, they say they were facing some printing problem. And besides that, the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro was facing the wind of change in international finance. Even when this film was made, electronic data had been introduced to the international financial market to overwhelm the paper money. 
the counterfeit business of the Cagliostro family itself became obsolete. Like the coin making by the upper Cagliostro became obsolete, the fake bill business run by the lower Cagliostro gradually went the same way. On top of that, they were having problems with their printers and the subordinates under Jodo, they're getting kind of old. So actually the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro only has two useful properties left. One is their blood, the oldest noble lineage in Europe. This tells us why he had to marry her, the marriage to unite the Count and the Archduke. Marrying Clarice, making a lot of babies, and they marry the heirs of any royal family in England, France, Spain, and so on, to take the throne of the country in the future. That's their only hope. And the other one is the treasure hidden by the ancestors. The Count was trying to turn things around with that. So the Count thought he could revitalize the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro using the treasure hidden by the ancestors and by marrying Clarice to utilize their oldest noble lineage in Europe for resuming political marriages with other European nobilities. Yes, like someone just commented, like what the House of Habsburg did. <laughs> like the House of Habsburg, but without money, less financial stability. And the last one, the feeling for Clarice, his love toward her. To be frank, I didn't get this. I saw every inch of every cut in this movie. But could not find any evidence or trace of the Count being in love with Clarice, not at all. Actually, I did find some scenes that may insinuate it, but when the scene changes, the Count just simply tries to kill or abandon her. Miyazaki tried to be careful to not blend in such amorous feelings in the film. As the Count is depicted as the man of stoicism, he may be hiding his feelings, but it seems rare for Miyazaki to completely eliminate such an aspect. So why did Lupin make fun of the Count saying lust and greed and cradle robber? To me, it's quite obvious. The Count Cagliostro is the shadow of Lupin, his alter ego. In the lecture of Laputa, I told you that Pazu would have turned into Muska if he hadn't met Sita. Similarly, Lupin and the Count Cagliostro, they are two sides of the same coin. In the previous lecture, I talked about the structure of the opening sequence of Lupin the Third. Lupin and the clan are lonely because they live in the outside world, the underground world distant from ordinary lives of ordinary people. And the Count, he actually tried to reach the world of light from the outsider's world, the underground world, the world inhabited by Lupin. The Count is more than aware that he is going nowhere with his counterfeiting and killing gigs. He knows that it would not bring a bright future to the Grand Duchy of Cagliostro. That's why he joins the UN, makes friends in Interpol, and broadcasts his wedding ceremony live to the rest of the world. The oldest noble lineage and the ancestors' treasure, he tried and wanted to use them to make his life legitimate. He wanted to believe in the oldest noble lineage and the ancestor's treasure because he knows that his hands are stained with blood. He says, yes, my hands are stained with blood, but so are yours. This is just his Sundara action. And what he tried to say was, in a sweeter tone, yes, our hands are stained in blood, and we must hold them together to try to live our lives in a place in the sun. The luxurious dinner, the banquet, and the ceremony symbolize his rebel against the Dark Count Cagliostro family. He actually wants to be the Archdukes he destroys. This film starts with Lupin hitting a casino, throwing the money out after realizing that they are fake and coming to Cagliostro. Actually, Lupin is also getting sick of the underworld and comes to Cagliostro longing for an ordinary life. 
So it's only natural to reunite with Clarice. That's why Lupin believed that Count Cagliostro wanted the money and fame and wanted the girl. They are both the same, two people living in the underworld trying to reach for life under the sun. But to do so, Lupin resorts to his thieves philosophy, whereas the Count resorts to conspiracy, what he and his family have been doing for ages. So you see, they don't change their ways, they have pride in what they do. <laughs> so that's why Lupin believes that Count Cagliostro wants Clarice, like he wants her. Count Cagliostro didn't mention that at all. It's just Lupin's one-sided belief that the Count wants Clarice. I've seen this relationship. It's identical to the one between Ging and Periston. They're the characters in Hunter x Hunter, and they're actually the same. Ging mentions this saying, you and I are the same. We always come up with unconventional ways. That's why they just cannot stand the existence of each other. <laughs> so, Lupin and Cagliostro, if they had met in another time and place, you know, Jigen and Goemon, they're just no good guys as well. So, if they met in another time and place, he would have replaced them to be Lupin's sidekick and the pair may hate each other as long as they live. It's a tragedy caused by the encounters of three people, Lupin, Clarice, and the Count, who were never supposed to meet. So in this story, Clarice was released, the Count died, and I personally believe that this Lupin incident was Lupin's last gig before he disappears from history. I'll get into this in the second half. Okay, in the second half, I'll be talking about the rumored director's cut of Cagliostro, the director's cut and why Lupin didn't take Clarice with him, as well as the epic corny line, your heart, that makes me go, oh, come on, every time, what does it mean? This castle of Cagliostro, some female pop stars back in the 80s, such as Tomomi Nishimura, I think, said they are a big fan of the movie, and further go on saying, I want to be in love with Clarice and Lupin is the man of my dreams, yada, yada, yada. Okay, yeah, I mean, they definitely got the wrong idea from watching it. Maybe it would be fine for some teenagers to think that way, but I mean, come on. There is a book called Four Years Later. It was published four years after the release of The Castle of Cagliostro. Miyazaki just rambles on about how he actually feels about the film in the interview in the last part of the book. And I will analyze that. Okay, so please fill out the questionnaire. It's a little early, but I'll finish before I kill my throat. While you're filling it out, I'll talk about what we're going to do in the next episode. It's the end of the month, so I'll be reading messages from my viewers. Comments, questions, anything you want. You can uh, just pretend to be someone or something. Like, for example... I'm the first lady of the Prime Minister of Japan. People kind of hate me lately. Or you can discuss your worries like, I'm a manga artist and I don't know where my career is going. You can just tell me some recent episode you encountered. That's what we'll be doing the next time. I think I deserve a slightly easier episode. I mean, we do the message thing next week and I think I'm finally doing the Sapiens, a brief history of humankind after that. It will be hard for sure. So please give me the numbers. Uh, thank you. I was definitely not in my best condition. My voice is hoarse. I finished five minutes earlier than usual because I prolonged the last one. No additional time for the free part? No, I did so much last time I learned my lesson. Well, before we go to the second half, maybe a little chit-chat. So basically, the episodes on Ghibli's work I do would basically involve Ota King sharing his imaginations. Reputa Castle of Cagliostro we picked up in this lecture, and the next one will be Grave of the Fireflies, or Porco Rosso, I think. 
There's too much subtext. I didn't realize this until I actually studied him, but Hayao Miyazaki, he has his unique and uncompromised style. So he knows for sure about the history of currency and when the transition between bills and coins occurred. In the images depicting the history of the Gothic bills I mentioned earlier, he uses the image of Napoleon while Lupin is talking about the fall of the Bourbon kings. You'll know why if you look closer and think, but you'll never know unless you concentrate. So the guy is so shy. It's not categorized as Sundar, he's like a king of twisted people. Introduction of analysis on works of such a person has to entail a footnote that it's just an imagination, and that's what I'll be doing. Well, not only Miyazaki, but people who make anime in general, they put so much thought into their work. This is something I learned a lot from my experience in making anime and games. So when I see interviews of anime directors and manga artists, I know for sure that they're holding back what they actually want to share with the world. Trying so hard. Mamoru Oshi is an exception. He just says everything. So this otaking imagination thing is based on my idea that for us, especially people in their 20s, and 30s, when we see anime, it would be more interesting to go deeper into what's between the lines. That's why they hate you. Ah, uh, exactly, they hate me for doing this. I mean, I can wait 1,000 years, but Ghibli would never offer me a job, like for commentary. Every time I read an official Ghibli book or commentary, I can clearly see that the company is offering the job to people who see their film as how Miyazaki wants them to. They have zero tolerance against people going further than that. Quite interesting. From my personal experience of making anime, I know that people making anime want audiences to see only in a way they want it to be seen. Maybe it's like a comparison between Diorama and a shadow box. Movie makers usually don't want you to see from any angle and direction, but only in a particular direction. That's why the commentaries become like what I mentioned. Okay, so let's go to the second half. In the second half, I'll start from the section The Castle of Cagliostro Fiasco in a book called Sweating and Drawing by Yasuo Otsuka. He confesses a deep remorse in this section. Okay, please switch to the second half. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous otaku king in Japan, otaking Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese, so please look forward to it. If you ask a, com a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture, and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies, so please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.